um, I want to um, uh, start by asking for a change in the agenda um, to add the first item to be review of the minutes of our October 6, 2023 meeting. Um, so if um, I can have a motion for that. A uh, motion to adopt the minutes of the audit committee meeting from Friday, October 6, 2023. Um, I think at this point, just the two of us. I think so. And I think you might have to second it. I'm seconding and agree. <laughs> So, um, so for um, for the item, uh, for, um, the first item after that is internal auditor's report. Um, um, and um, I would like my internal auditor to. Um, no, I was just going to say, maybe just because we've got some new uh, faces in the room, maybe we could just go around and uh, do a round of introductions and then I'll, uh, and then we'll get Mike uh, going with his report. So. Um, I'll start. Uh, Matt Leon, Assistant Superintendent of Business and Operations. We could sweat. Sure. <laughs> Mike DeSantis, Purchasing Agent. Welcome. Michael Wolf, Internal Auditor. Sarah Tischler, Board of Education member and this unit class of 2006. Tushan Terry Garcia, District Treasurer. Ali Say, Board Member and Audit Committee Chair. Uh, Ray Polakowski, my full time gig is VP of Finance and Administration for Special Olympics New York. And I guess I'm a community rep on this committee. Hi, I'm Doris Monroe. I'm the claims auditor. Teresa Duncan, uh, senior account specialist for business and operations. Great. Good morning, Kimberly. So we just went around and did a round of introductions. <laughs> Kelly, board of Ed president. <laughs> So before we uh, turn to Mike, just want to first uh, welcome Ray. Um, appreciate your interest in serving on the committee, and I know you'll be an asset to our work. Um, so looking forward to uh, looking forward to having you here, and we'll, we're going to connect for a few minutes afterwards. And I would just say, almost anyone in this room is a great resource in terms of the committee um, and the district. So, appreciate it. but appreciate uh, having such strong community involvement and um, your interest in being here. So thank you. Um, and you know we've got some other kind of you know new uh this i think is michael's first meeting as our purchasing agent um teresa um has recently stepped into the senior account specialist role for business and operations and we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that this morning so um maybe a little bit of a re recurring theme with uh some of our agenda in terms of uh getting to full staffing in the business office over the past year so um Welcome to the meeting, and I'll I'll turn it over to Mike. Just a little bit of a backdrop, uh, and he can speak in more detail. But each year, um, the district is required to um, the audit committee selects a focus area for an audit. Um, we have selected the area of payroll, and Mike's going to talk a little bit more about that. And then we also have a risk assessment that we go through um, each year, just to kind of assess risk in in our operations. And our financial practices. Um, Mike will talk about that as well. So, uh, see you hey, Mike. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Stay at my thought. <laughs> um, no, uh, as as uh, Matt just went over with the internal audit function, and just uh, since there are new people here, you know, Doris here is the claims auditor. I'm your internal auditor, and you also have an external auditor. There couldn't be more audits being done in school districts. Um, just to differentiate this, if any, if for any of you, the new members don't uh, know the differences, the external auditors are coming in here for your financial statements, and they're kind of doing the 50,000 foot level. Um, school districts with more than 1,500 students are required to have an internal audit, which is the risk assessment focus area um, every year. Um, so that you're, you've probably dropped down to the you know five to 10,000 foot level. And then Doris looks at every single expense that goes out of this building. So you're probably at the five foot level. Um, that's so, closer. Yeah. So with uh, with all three audits, you know, many schools in New York State um, are very, very protected because of having so many, so many auditors looking at everything. Um, the audit report, the audits um, cycle usually goes uh, because of because the school year ends. Uh, in June, sometimes school districts want to do audits that look back on the previous year. So even though the school year runs, you know, uh, 
July through June, the audit year does doesn't end. Their twenty three or twenty two twenty three audit year doesn't actually end until April thirtieth of this year. So that's why we're going to be finishing up one of the audits from last year. That audit is, uh, as as Matt explained, was we selected purchasing. It's an audit that we usually recommend doing once every five years, and it's been about that um, since we've done it. Um, when you we say a purchase or a, a payroll audit, or, I was going to say. <laughs> I was like, did I say purchasing? <laughs> Actually, um, that is not surprising because we went back and forth between purchasing and payroll. Yeah. So I think it's a little Freudian thing. Um, yeah. Uh, so the payroll audit. When you do a payroll audit, there are so many areas of payroll that we can audit. Uh, there's time and attendance. There's just the regular hiring practices. There's a separation in, in um, termination payments if you're doing a, a year where you're having early retirement programs with incentives. Um, and then also there's a look at the reconciliation of um, your withholdings and your insurance uh, program. Uh, I actually did come out a couple uh, weeks ago and we started doing, because we were gonna look at reconciliations um, and as I started the preliminary work, one of the things that I came away from was I had, don't have a place that I can really audit because as I started digging in, um, everything that I was looking at uh, was so well controlled and there were so many other compensated controls um, that at that point I was like, you know, if you want the audit to add value for the school, let's like do something where we can add some value. Uh, discussing, you know, Matt and Tachon got together and we're going to do, still do benefits, but we're going to lo look specifically at the self-insurance plan since that's uh, something more within the districts. And we're talking about the health insurance. Yes, yes, yeah, health dental. Yeah, because a lot of the other programs that we started looking at, like the withholdings that go to your unions uh, for the union dues, you know, the union is the one responsible for looking at that and saying, hey, did you send us the right amount of money? Um, you know, as long as everything gets set up on the front end in payroll, then everything is fine. But, you know, it's more the union's responsibility to know, did we send you the right amount of money? So there really wasn't anything for me to do there. Um, some of the other audits, you know, you're sending items to uh, New York State Tax Department. They tell you right away if you sent them the wrong forms and uh, the same thing with uh, some of the other items where we're sending items out. Was, so there wasn't really anything to reconcile in here. So. Um, so will your report be the on both? No, the uh, we're getting because of the August 30 deadline, we're finishing up February's there. We're finishing up the payroll report um, or doing the audit in uh, February and March. So this way it'll give us time to have it filed by April. The uh, risk assessment, we're going to start field work uh, second week of February or second week of April. I'm sorry. Um, and that is going to usually take, take uh, field work takes about a week. And um, then uh, we'd probably have the report within 30 or 60 days. But that report there isn't going to be due until April 30th of 2025. Okay. So in a way, you're doing this in advance for the next year? No, the, the risk assessment, usually that one you try to get done during the school year because you're evaluating the risks that you have during that year. But the focus area, a lot of times, the purpose of the audit is to look back and say, well, how well did we do that function during that year? So that's why a lot of times those audits are done after. But the risk assessment is done usually for most of my schools. They do it in the beginning of the year or, you know, by mid-year. The external auditors place some reliance on that, too. I mean, they look at what you've done and, and where you assess there's risk. Yeah. So it's helpful for them to have that done as well. Um, um, yeah, but, I'm sorry. No, okay. um, so I just am trying to understand because I, I think you mentioned two things and I just want to understand for myself. Um, you started with the payroll that we had you know, yep. talked about, and you found that there was really not much going on there. And so you've added this other area. The self-insurance. The self-insurance area. And would they, would both, both of these will not be done in the same cycle? No. The uh, the payroll one is a reviewing of work that took place in 22-23. Right. The risk assessment is a review of 23-24. Okay. okay. 
So even though there was not much, but we will still have a report for that cycle for the payroll. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Also, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're still, so we had decided as a committee to do a payroll audit. And then Michael had shared focus areas within payroll. And he started looking at deductions and okay. found that in terms of deductions, there wasn't going to be an audit and a subsequent report that would have provided a lot of value for us that we could learn from because from his kind of initial look at it things were as they should be so as we talked about you know do we switch gears within this we looked at kind of still within the realm of deductions and benefits um, we settled on health because we have our you know roster of employees you know who have elected health we have a self-funded plan so we pay all the claims that come in so there's people who are incurring claims or their dependents and then there's the deductions that we're taking based on what people have elected so i think and i don't want to be too far in front of your work but what where the audit focuses is are all of these items in alignment um, or are there any discrepancies where we could institute some greater checks to make sure that moving forward so that's kind of the the work within the realm of payroll and benefits is that okay. so the, the so the self-insurance plan um and and the area that you're looking at that is still within the payroll yeah. um, that we have talked about and we'll be ready about the same time. Yep. Okay. It's the deduction piece Yeah. for the We're, health insurance. The, yeah, and it's all, like, originally we were doing deductions, period, wide. Right, yeah. Now we're just saying we're, not only are we looking at the deductions for the self, self-funded self uh, insurance fund, but we're also going to be looking at the, the payments going out. Mm. You know, you, you know, making sure that, you know, for instance, um, someone has a child on their form that I think that that age is out of 26. So, you know, if there's some claims, I'm going to do some sampling to make sure that we're not paying any anybody who is over 26 years old mm -hmm. okay. that they were taken off. So and like, is it primarily on, like looking at if somebody signed up for family yep. coverage that they have the family amount coming out of their paycheck yep. right yep. okay so it's it's looking at both ends where originally we were just looking at the deduction side when we were talking to do, doing a deductions audit now we're just gonna we're gonna do both sides of uh, self-insurance which i think is actually quite helpful because we've had so much discussion about just the self-insured process that we use in general. So I know that this is really nitty gritty, yeah. but it at least informs us a little bit about how the processes are working with a direct impact on employees. So yeah. agreed. I think it's it's one important piece of a larger picture that we've been talking about. So mm -hmm. for the new members, I'll give you my business card before I leave so you can contact me anytime. I know sometimes after an audit committee meeting, there's a or a board meeting, there's a question that comes up, and by the time you get home, you're forgotten. So that's why you can call me and reach me, reach out at any time. Just in terms of your um, initial review, when you saw that things were working well, is that an area where things are often not working well? Is that like a frequent sort of problem child for school districts? Um, it can be, but it, a lot of times it's going to be to depend. Like a lot of my schools, the um, the payroll clerks have have retired within the last three to five years, so I have a lot of new clerks. So we're doing a lot more testing to make sure their their learning curve has has been uh, taken care of, and they they've learned the job. Um, most of the time, uh, with payroll deductions, you know, a lot of the schools they don't have self insurance plans, so then there is a lot more reconciliation because you have to make sure, you know. This month, you know, the 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 billings are going to come on a monthly basis, but you may hire someone mid month or someone gets terminated by month. So there's all kinds of formulas and gyrations you got to do to prorate things. Sure. So that's originally where we thought we were going to be going with this audit. But when we had the self insurance plan, that kind of threw that out. Gotcha. Can I ask a question about um, something that we've talked about with payroll specifically is redundancy and sort of the function of the department. Is that something that you look at or something that we've addressed? I know that we've talked about that. During the risk assessment, it is one of my questions to look, to talk with Deb and ask, you know, if you were on vacation or if you're not here, if something happens, can somebody do payroll in your absence? And um, usually the answer is we can probably hobble along and get through it. If 
for a one case scenario, but it's not going to be perfect. So I think things are moving. Yeah, I would add that we've we've taken some steps um, with Teresa to I think we'll be able to over some time more than hobble along. So Teresa has been working very closely with them to bring us up to that point. So great. Yeah. That, was, that response I'm giving you was from a year ago when I did it. <laughs> That's probably been on there a few years. <laughs> yeah, a couple of years with that. Thank you. So we move on to um, our next item. Anybody has any? Yep, okay. I think we're ready. Um, so um, in general claims auditor, Doris Monroe, who's been with us. Okay. So thick and thin. All right, does anybody need, I brought copies of the report for anybody that doesn't have their computer or a copy. So Matt had asked me to take a look at um, and report basically some exception trends. So I did a look back, a three-year look back. So we could start to get some hard data so we could track going forward. How are we doing in terms of our trend lines? Um, you can see for the three years, in 2021, we had 123 exceptions. 2022, we had 236. In 2023, we climbed about 7.5% to 253 exceptions. If you look at the growth in those exceptions from 2021 to 2023, it's up over 100%. So I think, you know, Matt agrees that we're gonna set this as a hard line and say, okay, we've got a new starting point. We're gonna work aggressively to, to start to reduce those numbers. Um, down below are the exceptions by type. And you can see that clearly the largest exception type are those confirming purchase orders. And Ray, just for your benefits, like me and maybe yours as well, Sarah. Um, a confirming purchase order is when somebody hasn't encumbered the money before they go out and acquire the goods or the services. Okay, they haven't requested permission and gotten approval to do so. And it also includes those purchase orders, the blanket purchase orders that we've run out of money and they've gone out and they've continued to buy. Okay, so that's what's included in that category. If you look at clearly, that's where we need to focus our energies, right? So that is our highest exception rate. If you look from 22 to 23, the confirming purchase orders dropped, but the no purchase orders have increased. And I'm gonna be pushing back this year in 2024 on no purchase orders. Anything that doesn't have a purchase order that should, I'm not going to approve. I'm going to push it back and I'm going to push it back to Mike and say, you know what? No, nope. get him to put a per purchase order. It will be a confirming purchase order, but let's get that purchase order in place because if we don't, we run the risk of missing it again the next year, right? So we, we need to have it in there. So when we look at what we've done in, in this fiscal year, it's it's their reminder for next year, okay? So we should see those no purchase orders go down considerably because I will be, you know, kind of pushing those back on the departments and, and to Mike so that those, those get purchase orders. Um, last year, in December of 2022, I came and talked to the audit committee and we had identified three areas that were really, we weren't doing well. It was confirming purchase orders. It was, um, we weren't in compliance with procurement regulations in a number of instances, and we had a lot of penalties and late fees. I think we're doing much better now with the purchasing, the new purchasing policy. I think we're doing much better following the procurement guidelines, especially with that new purchasing policy in place. The late fees and penalties, although you can see from 2022 to 2023, that number increased. The latter half of 2023, I started to see a decline in those. If you recall, we had identified um, a couple of areas that needed to be improved. It was national grid. So what now that we have a, a purchase or an accounts payable clerk, um, what she does is she goes in and pulls down those bills before they come in the mail. So we're getting those payments processed and out. Therefore, we're uh, you know eliminating the late fees. Um, we also had issues with tolls and late fees for tolls. And before Kristen left, she worked and got all of the vehicles tagged, you know, with the easy pass tags. So now I'm not seeing those come through. So, so huge improvement in those two areas. And also the third one was um, we were seeing a lot of late fees. I mean, big dollar late and fines. 
with William Scotsman, which were the trailers that we had rented during the capital project. And I think it must be Teresa to my right here who um, went in and um, I don't know if you renegotiated or we established new, but the last couple rounds of invoices have not, I haven't seen a dollar in, in late fees. So that's huge in terms of, um, you know, great, great progress in that arena. If we go to the next page, it just shows you the three year um, total by department so that you can kind of see who our outliers are and where we need to focus. Again, this just helps us identify what departments might need a little bit of remediation in terms of, you know, how can we prevent these things going forward. The last page is just identifying um, the steps that we have taken and then the next steps that need to be taken. So there is a new purchasing agent, Mike is in place, and there is a new senior account specialist for business and operations, and she's already made like a huge impact in terms of reducing some of those exceptions I've been seeing. Um, so those are really positive steps. The steps to the right there that I've identified, my recommendation for next steps are all the same things that I had out there for on December of 2022, okay? So, you know what, Matt, maybe you wanna speak to next steps and where you think you'll focus? No, so, um, you know, we, so first to kind of go back to the numbers, and I think we all agree that we wanna see this trend um, go down. And I think we've got a team in place that will make sure that that happens. Um, you know. Of the seven members of the business department, and this is just kind of a little bit of a background, all but uh, two of us have been in our positions for less than 15 months. So we're kind of, you know, there's a, a great team. We are uh, fully staffed almost uh, with Teresa moving into the senior account specialist position. We've got the executive secretary position open, but we're working on that as well. So there's been multiple uh, transitions, but the, the team that uh, is here, you know, I take you know, very little comfort in these numbers, but, but um, that the confirming POs have gone down and some of the prior year expense and fees and uh, interest is kind of the result of some of the catch up that this team has done kind of bringing that forward. So I think we are, you know, moving in the right direction. And when we have a 2024 column, I think we'll, we'll see that. Uh, some of the things that we've started to do and we'll continue to do is um, we're meeting with all of the office staff from the departments and the schools that are involved in purchasing at each superintendent's conference day as a business team. So kind of going back over some of the highlights of the purchasing uh, policy, purchasing requirements, um, talking to them about year end closeout as well as how they start the year, which is kind of where these issues um, tend to crop up. Um, in the four departments um, that were kind of at the top of that list here by having a new position of senior account specialist it's sort of a transition from uh executive secretary for uh operations and for facility or for food service i'm sorry the team after kind of multiple um after that position was largely unfilled for a couple of years came and said you know this is really a financial position and especially when you look at uh food service and you look at facilities that's where we really do you know it's very important how we start the year and close out the year but that kind of ongoing management because you can't predict everything that's going to happen particularly in facilities um, is going to be uh, super helpful the meetings with um, the office and school staff are helpful mike is doing some meeting with departments around when we get to this time of the year to kind of look at what they have open so that we can make some projections about what's needed for the rest of the year and how we start the year. Um, so a number of things kind of in motion, but the, the biggest thing um, is the, the people, uh, Tashawn, Mike, and Teresa and I kind of met yesterday and went over this report. We'll be having more conversations with Doris. I think we're moving the needle in the right uh, direction for sure. So right. um, the most important piece is getting this feedback to the departments. So the ones that are having the exceptions, they need to hear that they have these exceptions, and then we need to help identify with them how can we prevent these going forward. You know, what what blank what purchase orders do we need to get in place? What purchase orders do we need to add additional funds to so that you're covered through the end of the year? So it's that feedback. I love the education, Matt. You know, at the conference day, but now it's time to kind of focus on in giving people individual feedback. 
Can I ask a question? Um, and please forgive my ignorance, but um, I'm just not familiar with how, like, practically how these issues verbal up. So could you just provide an example of, like, an exception happening in a given department? For example, let's say food service. So what, why would there be a purchasing exception? Yeah. So a perfect example is they have um, repairs that need done, uh -huh. right? The dishwasher, the ovens, whatever breaks down. They call the repair company, the repair company comes in, makes the repair, they send us an invoice. We didn't have a purchase order with that vendor. I see. Okay, so it's identifying before you call a vendor and request any kind of good yeah. or service, you yeah. have to get a purchase order in place. I see. Okay. And so in that scenario, would the preferred route to avoid an exception be to figure out who they already have a purchase order with or to set up a purchase order with a new repair shop? Like well, they, there's is either one. There's steps that yes, yeah, okay, okay, absolutely, okay. Um, but there's steps that they have to take based on how much they anticipate spending. They have to do some competitive pricing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yes. Got it. Okay. That so, makes perfect sense. Thank you. Sorry. sorry. Um, okay. So as we get to you know to kind of carry that example on a little bit, as we get to this time of year into the spring, we take a look at what we're going to need for next year and if we take the uh equipment repair for the kitchens as an example right we'll be doing we'll be doing bids if we expect that to be over certain limits we'll designate someone who will be doing that work next year Teresa will assess kind of where we've been in the past so that what the purchase order that we put up in July is reasonable for the year ahead and then if we sense a trend of Oh no, and hopefully this is not the case. The equipment is is breaking and we need more, you know. One, we have to assess if it's time to replace some things, but two, you know, we want to increase that purchase order proactively rather than the invoice comes and it needs to be. Got it. Yeah, and to your points that both of you made, Matt and Doris, I can totally see why if your job, if your everyday job is not to deal with purchase orders, why someone might not appreciate the importance of going through that procedure if they have an emergency and the dishwasher is broken in the middle of the Yeah, day. emergencies are different. Emergency repairs are different. Okay. I'm talking about regular purchase of goods and services. Sure. You know, doing all of your purchase orders for all of your food yeah. for the children for the yeah. year and not getting around to it until September when you started making those purchases in August. I gotcha. Okay, so it's yeah. Yeah, so doing it in the right order. For sure. And exactly what you said, I think now that you have the information and the, you know, the hard numbers, providing the feedback to the individual departments will be super helpful. And yeah, but I think the biggest thing is like Matt spoke to is they're finally, you know, fully, almost, almost fully staffed in the business yeah. office. Yeah. And they've added a new level of talent that I think will go a long way in looking at some of this stuff. Because ideally, you know, it it would be in a perfect world, right? The business office helps these departments. At the beginning of the year, if they provide a three-year look back of here, here's your top 15 vendors. This is what you spent each of the last three years. What do you anticipate? Do you think you're going to use them more or less? But at a minimum, you need to encumber what you spent last year, right? If you're going to use them. And we haven't ever been staffed to the point where we can provide that level of data and service. And unfortunately, outside of the business office, the departments aren't that savvy enough to, they don't have time to do that, right? So I think that would be, you know, if we focus on the top three or four departments and, and really look to help provide that data, we can go a long way to eliminating but it comes with being properly staffed, right? You yeah. can't do all of this work if you don't have enough hands on deck. Absolutely. Thanks for that context. It's really helpful. Does Doris's report go to like a cabinet meeting at all? It it doesn't. It certainly can. Um, oh, I yeah. one of the places I work at, um, the claims order report goes monthly to like a cabinet meeting. And it shows not only the number of exceptions, the dollar amount exceptions, because like there's you know, where I'm working, one of the places I work, there's one exception from that department, but it's a quarter of a million dollars. So it stands out. And I know the peer pressure that comes out of the administrative meeting, because usually if somebody has like a big trend, 
superintendent like kind of reads in the right act in front of everybody else and once that happens it also helps in cleaning it up well i would say that kind of brings me to one other point that i was wanted to make which is you know doris and i have had the conversation about um you know kind of the feedback loop for this group and i think what we'll do is at the january meeting each year is kind of look at the annual trends um and hopefully we'll see you know everything going in the right direction and then when we get to the spring we'll look at any kind of uh highlights that you see or you know kind of early indicators of of where we're at and so i think that would be a good good thing and we'll kind of have these these numbers to track year over year so. okay if i could just add one other thing i i think you'll notice when you look at your board packet so it, in the past, I used to put the exceptions behind each warrant, and it was a lot for you guys to kind of get through to figure out, geez, how are we looking this month? Now I give you a one-page summary at the top of that report that has all of the exceptions for the month. And the last few months, it's it's been a full page, right? So you're going to just visually, you're going to be able to start to see each month. Hopefully that starts to shrink, right? We, we, we eliminate some of those rows. So that's just a place where you guys can kind of take a look and see, you know, month to month, how are we looking? Um, so this, you know, at least in the time that I've been in the audit committee, I know that this has been an issue. And, um, you know, it is disappointing to see that we have actually sometimes done worse or have remained the same, right? Um, and we've had a lot of transition, of course. Um, and, um, I think one of the things that was discussed was that um, I think in the su uh, superintendent's training day, um, the secretaries were supposed to be trained. That has already happened. So this yeah, is that's ongoing. That's, uh, yeah. that's but that is ongoing. Right. We've had you know some transitions there, and we do reach out to individuals as they're onboarded. Right. So right. Um, so I think, um, and I don't know what other board members feel. Maybe I should uh, you know uh, ask. This question actually of the two of you. Um, does it make sense for us to see this once a year, or does it make sense for us to see it, let's say, once in six months? Because um, your uh, report is usually in the consent agenda in the main board. Mm -hmm. um, so we really don't have very robust discussion about that. So that may be something that we, I think, as board members should think about. And maybe once a year is a good interval for the trend but maybe once in six months so something for us to consider for the future um so but yeah i appreciate all the work that uh, everybody is doing because i know that this is not because anybody in this room <laughs> doesn't want it to be better it's outside of this room <laughs> so i appreciate all that you guys are still trying to you know make happen so thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? Can I just add that um, we can, after you have feedback, uh, Doris and I can certainly work on kind of a plan for the frequency and the right level of detail um, for these meetings. And if you choose a different timeline, we can we can make anything uh, work. I also want to highlight in terms of you know we. I think the training with the uh, building staff and uh, department staff is incredibly important and i think we'll see that borne out in numbers but when you look at the uh, departments toward the top of the list i i would say you know we're taking specific steps within the business office to kind of expand what we think of as a business and operations team so that we can get ahead of this because that's really where you know the frequency of transactions week in and, and week out occurs so it does seem like it's this, i mean the food i think uh, i don't Recall at least us having a lot of discussion, but maintenance. I know we've had a discussion many, many times. So, I know obviously it's the nature of the job. Also, I mean they have to do a lot more thinking than other people about, like you know, what to replace. Anyway, on, um, on the food service, do you know if it's coming from the BOCES manager or is it coming from your own employee? Yeah, that's an important uh, caveat. That yeah. food service in the context of this discussion was purely an example to talk about the way the process works on on the ground um yeah yeah and if you if you look at 2022 food service had 33 exceptions for the year the vast majority of those um mike were because we didn't encumber the dollars before we started making purchases for the return to school in september 
Okay. But that improved. I mean, Megan nailed it this year. Yes, right? I mean, we're down to a handful, 12 for the year. And, and it's not those same types of exceptions. It's more the little stuff that kind of we just didn't encumber the money beforehand. But the big ticket items were, were planned for and the POs were in place. Finally, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to thank Doris for, you know, not just the work that she does on the check warrants week in, week out, and for all the work that went into this report, for, for really just being kind of a partner, not just in here are the numbers, here are the exceptions, but in how do we uh, get ahead of this and make sure that we're as proactive as possible. So I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, uh, now, with the next agenda item, um, I don't see any here is that something we're going to table uh no it's just uh purely informational just to kind of let everybody know that we're already in the planning phases for the 23-24 external audit um our, they'll be here for the preliminary meeting with the committee on May 10th, and then just that we have their summer field work scheduled for the week of August 26th, which we think is kind of a, a good spot to allow us to do our year-end uh, activities after 6.30, um, but give them enough time to get in, do their work, and turn the report around for the, for the committee. So um, just purely to kind of let everyone know that those things are, are scheduled and we're in, we'll be in good shape there. Um, thank you. And, and um, you know, um, Ray, I know that you are um, new to the um, to this committee, but, um, you know, folks here, especially, you know, a, a lot of people here um, other than Doris have are relatively new to our team and they've done a yeoman's job getting, you know, in the thick of things, you know, uh, making sure everything goes well. Um, so, you know, we have not, you know, with external auditors and so forth, they have done a tremendous job. So, and I expect, you know, the same will happen again. Doris is the most senior person here than me. It's <laughs> the white hair, Mike. <laughs> 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 Senior in terms of that service. <laughs> Otherwise, you're a young, young person. <laughs> I do want to give to Sean a lot of credit for keeping that audit process on track by, you know, reaching out and making sure that we have these dates already um, scheduled. And then, you know, if anyone thinks of, you know, kind of easygoing days of summer in July and August, <laughs> um, that may be the case for others, but certainly not for to Sean. And it's a lot of work that goes into making sure that they're ready. So much appreciated. Thank you, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so um, uh, the next item is the reserve fund. Yes. So uh, these two items are just something that we purely also wanted to bring attention to the committee. And for those who are, you know, on the board and those who are on finance committee have kind of heard a lot of this before. So I try not to belabor it, but just want to make sure that, you know, this committee is kind of briefed on where we're headed in terms of uh, potential uh, reserves. So there's a uh, a link in there. We don't need to go through it in terms of the capital reserve, but in 2015, I believe the board uh, the board proposed and the community endorsed a $20 million capital reserve, which essentially says that in years where there's any surplus that we can fund a capital reserve of up to $20 million in contributions over, um, over a 10 year period. So in terms of, uh, timing of that, you know, we know that we would, um, you know, I'm sorry, it was 2016. So we've got a few years left in terms of the time horizon that we could fund the reserve, but based on the uh, 16.7 million that we've put in there to date, um, we're, we could reach that limit sooner. And knowing that we've got, you know, we've got a capital project vote in a few weeks and we don't need a new reserve for that. The funds that we're proposing to use from the reserve are already in the current reserve for that. So I don't wanna confuse those conversations. But knowing that we're talking about a vote in 2027 that we've got, we know we have significant needs in terms of across the district, but also some ambitious plans for the high school that we've started to think about for 2027. We would, you know, want that as one strategy to mitigate the year to year impact on taxes. Um, so with kind of the capacity uh, dwindling and contributions for the current reserve, we are going to suggest um, bringing to the community this May authorization for a new capital reserve, which is what districts you know will do when they've kind of exhausted the capacity or are nearing the exhaustion of their capacity in their current reserve. So just wanted to put that forward to the committee. 
we still have to have more conversation with our fiscal advisors in terms of what kind of limit we would propose for that reserve. So we could, we certainly will bring that back to the finance committee um, where we had more of this conversation and where we'll be working on our um, long-term reserve plans uh, this spring. But wanted to just put that out here and just see if there were any, any questions um, about that or any more information we could provide. I have a general question. Sure. Why, what's the rationale for um, a limit? I mean, I know it's it's required under the law, but what, like, logically, what's the rationale for imposing a limit and then forcing? Is it like the, is the idea that you want taxpayer input every so often so they don't want it to just be like unlimited? I'm just curious about that. That I don't have, to be honest, a whole lot of insight into that. You know, Mike or Doris uh, or Tashawn May, I think, you know, the comptroller, you know, will often kind of weigh in on school district reserves, um, publishes information about allowable uses when you're authorized to, to use it. So it's probably in that vein of putting some uh, control over it rather than at some point in time establishing a capital reserve and just, you know, having it into the future. Yeah. Uh, so there is a, a degree of kind of checking in with the community on that from from time to time. But is there a maximum limit in time or dollar amount that can be established? I would have to look. Yeah, but like you should have a projected idea of what you're using it for. You know, if you know if the last big capital project you have was twenty million and you got one hundred and fifty million in there, yeah, they're gonna have a big problem with it. I got you. So yeah, I don't. I think they don't want districts squirreling money away into exactly. this sort of right. Exactly. So giving you your own ability to set your guidelines, uh -huh. but I think the expectation is that you would. And and this is really, I don't want to speak. You know, in in terms of, of across the entire existence of the district, but we have a very clear plan for the first time in a while of successive capital projects so it gives us the ability to sort of forward plan a little bit more which will give us the ability to perhaps adjust that number or the time period which we'll have the fund um active for until we have to renew again but i think the the rationale would probably be so that you don't just go oh we've got all this fund balance we'll just keep sticking yeah. it over here and not um you know look for other ways to expend that money appropriately that makes sense. And I think the governor brought this up this year, um, you know, talking about districts with reserves um, because they are aiding us. Mm -hmm. So the assumption is that, you know, if you have so much money, what do you need all this aid for? And the capital reserve kind of makes that money unavailable for general budget. At least that's what I think. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. And the reserves are looked Fair at by your external auditor too, because you know I have had a couple of auditors that have said you know you know like a workers comp reserve, you know, like you haven't had that many workers comp claims, you know you got too much in your reserves, and they've got to push back them to lower it. And a lot of other reserves have actual dictated, you know, either caps yeah. or recommendations for where you should be to protect yourselves as a district. This is a little bit more freedom for us to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just good and bad, I guess. <laughs> no, it makes sense. I'm just I've, it as a taxpayer. It was always sort of mysterious to me why this mechanism existed. Um, so thanks to my service on the school board, it's becoming more clear, and I can convey that information to the steward confused. And I think that's very important because when um, when we see the uh, the ballot. Yeah. When we see the vote, a lot of folks don't fully know like, why is there a, a you know twenty million or whatever million amount there, and uh, and and I think it's a hard and and that's something where like you know I know you're not communication anymore. You talk to communication, and that's where I, I think our district really has like such a task to explain that to our people that what yeah. this means. This doesn't mean that you're being taxed on it. It's just our ability to put the money away. Yeah, so right. like in, in 2016, you know, not knowing what, certainly not knowing what the next period of years would, would look like, we um, did communicate, you know, this doesn't mean that we are, 
we will set aside twenty million dollars. It just means if we're in a position that we're able to. So we right. have, you know, been in that position, and you know, the the federal funds kind of indirectly helped just because they provided school districts with additional revenue. The full funding of foundation aid um, helped as well. So the next set of years are not likely to be like the most recent set of years. Uh, however, you know, it is a place that helps us um, mitigate the tax impact of, of capital projects. And we also talked to the uh, finance committee, too, over the last year about the fact that, you know, there's kind of a multiplier effect with state aid. So for every dollar that we do have in that reserve and then we bring forward, we generate a percentage of state aid on. So. Well, and it also, I think you've done a really good job of communicating that it helps keep that taxpayer contribution steady across time, you know, as much as possible, having that that reserve. So and in in concert with the aidable um, work. So so the, the reserves plan also kind of sets forward some of the things in statute or local policy where we are uh, either capped or we have specific restrictions on how the funds can be utilized. Um, tax tertiary is an example where each year we go through an exercise. So I think we look at, you know, potential liability at like 80% of outstanding claims. So we make adjustments to kind of have it funded at that level, but not greater. So um, we can circulate that plan if people think it would be helpful. Um, be happy to do that, but we're going to be looking at it with the finance committee this spring. So I think you guys always do such a tremendous okay. job. Uh, I don't think we need to yeah, see that. You guys want to think so, especially given that we can somewhat predict what's down the road. You know, we're already yep. starting to think about 27 and I'm sure beyond. Um, and we have sort of a, an understanding of, well, where we are right now. I think where we are right now with costs and everything is probably on the higher end of anything. So if we are using that as an, you know, example of what might be to come, it can kind of guide us in setting that limit. Yeah, no, makes sense. So, okay. So um, um, I think, um, are there any other items I, that anybody I just want to touch quickly on the self-funded health insurance reserve. So this is something that uh, so many school districts around the state, you know, have a self-funded health insurance plan like we do. The law authorizes school districts to have a reserve for their self-funded plans with special legislation. Um, we do not have a reserve. One of the areas that we think would be particularly helpful, you know, our spending, you know, budget spend is in the 13, 14 million dollar neighborhood for, for health insurance. Um, you know, as the claims come in, we pay them over time, you know, it's fared better. And I know I said this at the board meeting the other night that our increases have fared better than kind of general health insurance market conditions. Um, but one of the things that we do purchase is stop loss insurance for claims above $275,000. Those premiums um, have increased significantly in the last uh, few years to the point where of that budget line in next year or in calendar year 2024, that will be 1.4 million of our health insurance uh, trend. So one of the things that if we were able to have a reserve to kind of backstop some of those catastrophic claims, we could, and you know, in, in a given year, we may have one or two, we may have an outlier year where you have five, um, you know, and certainly the, the stop loss helps in those years. But if we were able to increase that threshold, so we're paying claims, you know, up to a certain level, we think we could dramatically cut those premiums. So we had a great meeting last week with Senator Tedisco about sponsoring uh, special legislation so that we could are authorized to have this reserve. We have a meeting with assembly member SEC coming up next week. Um, we've got a one pager that we kind of bring uh, forward to those meetings. So um, we're optimistic we'll we'll see where it lands i'd be great if uh this session we were able to get that authorized but we'll keep everyone informed but just again trying to consider another tool to help us kind of you know provide the benefits that we do but uh, mitigate the cost not just for the district but for employees um taxpayers so it's also important to note that this legislation has been enacted for other so it's kind of us tacking on right so yeah. it's not totally unique. We're not asking something out of the realm of possibility. It's just making our case for why yes. we should be allowed to yeah, do this. There's, I think, 10 to 15 schools in the bill. And I think like it would just be kind of adding us to the to the list. It's, it's our vision anyway. So. Anything else? Are there any other items? OK. Um, so um, I, I, I believe our next meeting is 
hopefully put here is March 15th. <laughs> um, and um, I, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. 905, meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, Cynthia aware? There he goes. <laughs> <laughs>